Hi, I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. You know, one of the challenges that we see uh, organizations face is how to move uh, from a traditional SAN environment to more of a hyper-converged environment. Uh, joining me on the light board to discuss that is Augie Gonzalez. He is the director of product marketing with DataCore Software. Augie, thanks for joining us today. Hey, George, good to be here. So why don't we talk about this a little bit? That, that, this is a real kind of a hurdle for organizations to get over, right? It certainly is, and it's two parts to it. One is they have aspirational interest in modernizing and collapsing their infrastructure. At the same time, they have sunk cost and in good investments that they've made in the past. So what we want to do is bridge those two and take best advantage of the resources available to us. Yeah, because I think the typical HCI pitch, HCI vendor pitch is throw out all the stuff you've already paid for and start over with our stuff, right? Yes. That's, that's, not, that's a non-starter, That's right? right. I yeah. mean, if you're starting a greenfield opportunity and a new project, that's okay, but you spend a lot of money on one of these puppies, you want to be able to use them. Yeah, so why don't you take us through it? Okay, so this is a, a classic three-tier SAN where we have the servers up here, we have our SAN connection, and maybe a couple of tiers of storage. That is, this would be your primary data sitting on your fastest storage, and then some of the bulk storage in for maybe a secondary type class of applications or as data ages. So what we're going to do is deal essentially with several problems that cu customers are confronting. One is the vulnerability. Okay. And the vulnerability that I want to talk about is while we have very rigorous routines and disciplines for managing these external arrays, they are single points of failure, despite having a lot of internal redundancy from a site location and everything else sure. that's the case. The second part is an aging issue, and there's two elements to that. Aging data, how do you move it from T1 to T2? Mm -hmm. And that today is a manual process, so we have to go and decide, well, okay, this one I think has expired its useful life over here, so let's not occupy resources there. Or, or what I find is they just give up and just, you know. They don't bother. Whatever, yeah. Right, exactly. So yeah. a lot of it ends up tying this, and what you end up doing is basically buying more of those. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. The, the uh, third part is the equipment itself is aging. Mm -hmm. And so this was a, a nice all-flash array today. Come next year, that baby's old, old uh, story. Right? Yeah. And so much for here. The uh, third element of that is clearly we are underfunded to be able to keep up with the capacity right. that grows out of this. And so you see T2s and T3s in effect grow over time. This may be a pretty standard element, a com more compartmented part, mm -hmm. because your working set tends to be pretty normalized. Right. So, so to summarize, we've got a, a vulnerability concern. A, uh, a, a data aging concern and then just a lack of IT resources. IT resources and IT funding. Okay. So what, the, the word these days is everybody needs to go out to HCI. You know, we hear a lot about that and certainly we're a proponent of that. What we want to do is take you consciously through there and understand what, where is the value in that and how do we in fact take advantage of some of these investments we've made here. Okay. Okay. And so the first thing we're going to do, George, is we're going to go in here and we're going to say, Let's, let's consider these not as isolated or silos of storage, but treat them as a pool. Okay. And for that, we're going to layer in software right in here. And that's going to be our software-defined storage layer that's going to take on that capacity, federate those resources, so that they can be addressed from the applications without knowledge about their nuances. Right, okay. So I'm moving the intelligence essentially out of the array and putting it up here. Yes, and I'm also providing uniformity in how you provision it, right. how you do data protection, and how you best utilize those resources. Gotcha. Okay. Right. The second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create some redundancy for us. Identified single points of failure as the issue. So the way we'll do that is we'll actually take and create a second copy of, let's call it over here in small, T1 and T2. So anything that gets written to T1, mm -hmm. primary hot data, will also appear in a second copy. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fundamental, if I lose that array or the location where that's at, mm -hmm. I have a fallback. Gotcha. This is an active, active environment. Okay. So that failover and switch over happens dynamically without any of these consumers being aware of that. Gotcha. Okay. So having done that, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of the entire thing and start considering our destination. Okay. So for that, let's draw this a little bit in, in a, a big, bigger picture of this one. And we'll expand on this. Let me draw that like that. So we have a number of virtual machines, and those virtual machines 
in a HCI environment, essentially are talking through what you could call a software backplane. That software backplane is the virtual SAN mm -hmm. that they're using to normally talk to the, their internal storage, and that may be flash or NVMe type PCIe cards, right. and maybe some spinning disks as well. Okay. And that's, that's their path. And then already we see in the HCI world, we have an in interest in replicating these. So you always are running at least two copies, maybe three copies of the data, and that's facilitated through an external connection, that network connection, okay. with our other part of our cluster over here, our other virtual machines. And right. we, can, we can do that as needed, off the board, basically. Right. <laughs> so how do we translate that into here? It's actually pretty straightforward. So part of what the data core is accomplishing here is making that transition a part of the natural migration, natural cycle of their IT infrastructure. And the first thing we're going to do, you see we've already picked these things up. Well, what I didn't tell you when I put this layer up here, is this layer can be itself instituted or implemented on servers. Okay. So we can insert in band mm -hmm. servers to take on these nodes, become the SDS front ends to the existing storage, and they, these are incorporated inside here. These storage resources are incorporated here. These are the external resources gotcha. hanging off okay. of that one. Mm -hmm. So now we can start to see how that picture looks over here. We're going to take these two nodes. Right. They're going to end up being like this. Okay. And when we make that cutover, this is happening. Once we are inserted into the picture, all this can happen non-disruptively. So okay. this, is, this is an essential part of the value proposition to be able to affect the cutover gracefully on a self-service basis, self-paced basis, without taking our consumers down. Gotcha. Okay. So am I running the, the software-defined storage software on each node in the HCI cluster? Or how's we that are. Work? Okay. We're running it right here. So this, okay. the SDS is going to be that software backplane that's going to be operating right in the junction between storage and the virtual machines. Okay. That, that picture got a little bit ugly there, but you understand the... <laughs> well, then if I add another node, I'm basically expanding my... Expanding SDS that. Okay. So what we've done is basically almost... Think of this as flipping it on its side, mm -hmm. is essentially what we've done. We've done that transposition yep. of it. But what we've done also is we've now have the opportunity, rather than having to acquire new resources here, we can actually draw these externally. So that may have been initially the T1 that was out here. I mean, sorry, that one. And this T2 might have been the original tier two external stories that we had. Gotcha. So that way I can leverage that existing investment into my HCI environment. Exactly. Okay. And, and, and there might be a situation even going forward where an external array just from a cost perspective or something might be a better option for me too, right? It would be, and it, especially for the tier two and, and tertiary type storage, mm -hmm. where that tends to exceed the physical capacity of what you can put inside a server. So what you want to do there is kind of look outside, outside the box, mm -hmm. literally, and maybe what you, you will do over time is, this one, when it gets long on the tooth, is you will replace it with internal storage. Some of the stuff you've already used here right. to make that here. And the T2, the tier two storage, would likely be something that continues to grow outside the boundaries of the, the uh, physical chassis here. So we would treat that, continue to use external arrays possibly there. And to the point where you could look at things like cloud-based storage for your archives right. and long-term storage here. So in, in this picture, what we are doing is essentially moving the resources a little bit and readjusting them, and they can continue to be compact. Now, over time, George, what will happen is this continues to move on its own pace. And so as these faster technologies are inserted into this picture, we can replace those non-disruptively and put in the new T1 and maybe make the old T1, T2. Gotcha. Okay. So let's, let's kind of... Uh, uh, summarize then, because we talked about vulnerability, and I, I'm assuming that that's handled because of this uh, mirror capability that's right. right here, right? Now the aging, is that ha do you, does the SDS automatically move it between the tier one and the tier two? It does. Okay. So the software is doing uh, several functions. One was at mirroring, mm -hmm. and it can also do remote replication for DR. But as importantly, it is watching the traffic and it's seeing the access frequency to certain volumes, and it can detect, therefore, when you have something that's being hammered, heavily loaded, right. and those that are fairly infrequently 
Gotcha. Users. And so it will make through machine learning, it basically says, okay, certain parts of these things, I need to start moving it in this direction. In this environment, that'll be the same thing. It'll move from here to here. And eventually, if you see lack of use altogether, you will see it gravitate all the way out. Gotcha, okay, so that, that takes care of our uh, aging problem. And I guess the third one was lack of uh, resources and budget. And I, I would assume just having a centralized console is going to be a big uh, helper there, right? It is. So one way to provision resources, one skill set to do that, we don't have to worry about the idiosyncrasies of each array and having specialists in each of those areas. Instead, we have a uniform layer that we, we use at the, the command and control center for mm -hmm. all of these. And that's what's going to help us, regardless of what technology. So that third part of the aging was the hardware itself aging. Gotcha. Okay. okay. So as the hardware ages, we don't have to keep track. Was this new system compatible right. with the old one? Am I using the same tool set? Yes, we're using the same tool set because it's been up-leveled right. to that central command and control. So I guess in that case, I can, when you said go ahead and put a new T1 in, I can automatically migrate data to that T1 without having to worry about that. That's right. You basically designate it. You say this T1, we're going to pull it out or we're going to make it T2, and we're going to evacuate it if it's going to come completely out of commission, and then we will replace it live mm -hmm. with its new, new element, new member that's come into the picture. So Augie, one of the things that, you know, as we're in transition, um, how can you help with uh, managing and analyzing this uh, environment? A real fundamental way we do that is we have a cloud-based analytics package out here called Data Core Insight Services. Data Core Insight Service is independent of the, the topology of the infrastructure. So whether you're running an HCI environment as we've described here, whether you have existing three-tier SANS, it can look across those okay. and still understand from the telemetry that's arriving, so all of these basics are transmitting their state, only machine data, no personal information right. being shared here, and it is using artificial intelligence to detect known problems. It's acting as the observability layer watching over them saying, I'm seeing flaws that you may not have detected or we can anticipate these issues might be coming if you don't take care of business soon enough. And we can also start doing some capacity projections, say we're about to exhaust some resources. Let's make sure we bring in some additional capacity in certain areas. Maybe T1 is running out of space or more likely T2 is starting to get chewed up pretty quick. Gotcha. And that happens here. And then does this work across uh, just one customer or is this, are you leveraging information across multiple customers? Part of the beauty of that is in fact the knowledge base mm -hmm. and its pool of understanding is drawn from thousands of customers okay. across the globe. Now none of those informations are shared with each other. We're simply saying we're seeing patterns. We've seen patterns in other locations similar to yours that are representative and those are leading indicators of what you need to do better here. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, and so I, I, I could see where that would really drive down the uh, time spent in having to manage and troubleshoot the environment, right? It does, yes, and it also basically is going to avoid potential issues, yeah, be right? so you don't have, right, even though we are taking care of a lot of the downtime issues and the single point of failures, you still have equipments that are starting to show signs and sure. indicates it's like, I am about to break right. here, so let's, let's replace that while we can. Right. So this is running in the cloud and it has visibility to all these and we can switch you directly from that SaaS based experience mm -hmm. without you knowing it when it actually makes not only the monitoring of it but it, it makes for actionable, actionable insights. Okay. Actionable insights. And those actionable, in, actionable insights will transition you to the command and control where it works you right through, steps you right through the workflow that's required to remedy and resolve the issue. Okay. So it's not just a passive listener right. and watcher, it's actually a active element getting you in control without you having to learn what steps are necessary. Right. Well, one of my complaints about some uh, monitoring tools like that is they kind of, I always say they tell you the patient's bleeding, but they don't tell you how to fix it, right? So it sounds like you guys have addressed that. We got the ambulance and we got the doctors in place. <laughs> there you both. go. Yes. So there you have it. Not only did we give you some ideas on how to transition from a traditional SAN environment to a hyperconversion environment, but also how to address key vulnerability issues, uh, data aging, 
and also uh, to be more efficient to manage the environment better. I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Thank you for joining us.